So what's a colloid engine? So the same rocket people that um, came up with with these ideas for electric propulsion um, probably in the middle of, of last century uh, also realized that there's one more place to get charged particles from um, if you're going to be using electric propulsion. So you can take a gas and you can ionize it. But there are also some liquids, particularly ionic liquids, which is what we use, that you also can um, use as a source of ions. And if you have ions and you put them in a field, you generate a force. So they recognize that. But um, part of being able to leverage that technique is being able to kind of manipulate those liquids on a scale of nanometers or, or, you know, very few microns. So, you know, the diameter of a human hair or something like that. And in the fifties, there was no way to do that. So they wrote about it in some books and then it kind of died for a little bit. And then with, um, silicon mems, computer processors, and, and when foundry started becoming more ubiquitous and my advisor, um, started at MIT, uh, kind of put those ideas back together and was like, hey, actually, there's now a way to build this and bring this other technique to life. Um, and so the way that the way that you actually get the the ions out of those liquids um, is you put the liquid in a in again, a strong electric field, and the electric field stresses the liquid. And you keep increasing the field, and eventually the liquid will assume a, I'll go this way, a, a conical shape. Um, it's the it's when the electric field pressure that's pulling on it exactly balances the liquid's own restoring force, which is its surface tension. Mm-hmm. Cool. So you have this balance, and the liquid assumes a cone um, when it's perfectly balanced like that. And at the tip of a cone, um, the radius of curvature goes to zero right at the tip, um, and uh, the radius, uh, sorry, the electric field um, right at the tip of a sharp object would go to infinity because uh, it goes um, uh, as one over the radius and one over the radius squared. And instead of the electric field going to infinity and maybe like generating a wormhole or something, um, a jet of ions instead starts you know, issuing from mm-hmm. the tip of of that liquid. So the field becomes strong enough there that you can pull ions um, out of the liquid. Yeah, what is the liquid we're talking about? So, um, or is it th- there's a bunch of different ones. You can do it with um, with different types of liquids. It depends on you know how easily you can free ions from their neighbors and if it has enough surface tension so that you can build up a high enough electric field. But um, what we use are called ionic liquids, and they're really just positive. They're uh, they're very similar to salts, but they happen to be liquid over a really wide range of temperatures. This sounds like really cool. It, <laughs> okay, yes. so how big is the uh, how big is the cone? Are we talk uh, what what's the size of this cone that so generates the ions? So, if you have a cone that's emitting pure ions, um, the I can't remember if it's the radius or diameter, but um, that emission is happening from of that cone is something like twenty nanometers. Oh. I was imagining something slightly bigger, but so like this is, so this is tiny, tiny. Yes. Hence the only being able to do it recently. Yeah, that's right. So this is all controlled by a computer, I guess. Like, or like, how how do you control, (laughs) how do you create a cone that generates ions at a scale of nanometers exactly? So the kind of main trick to making this work is that physically we manufacture hundreds or thousands of sharp structures and then supply the liquid to the tips. So that does a few things. Um, It makes sure that we know where the ion beams are forming so we can put holes in the grid above them to let them actually leave instead of hitting, right? Cool. (laughs) Um, But it also reduces the actual field we have to, the voltage we have to apply to create that field because the field will be much stronger if we can already give the liquid a tip to form on. Um, and those tips we form have radii of curvature um, on the order of probably like single microns. So we are working at a little bit larger scale. But once we create that support and the electric field can be focused at that tip, then the tiny little cone can form. On so wait, that. so th- there's something in the, there's an already like a hard material yes. 
that like gives you the base for the cone mm -hmm. and then you're pouring like liquid over it, whatever. From the, the bottom, that... yeah, it's porous. So we actually supply it from the back of the chip and then And then liquid wicks. forms on top yeah. on, on that structure. Yeah. And then you somehow make it like super sharp, the liquid, mm -hmm. so the ions can mm -hmm. leave. <laughs> uh... And then we've applied that field to get those ions <laughs> and that same field then accelerates them. That's awesome. And there's like a bunch of these. Yeah, I should have, I should have brought something. Um, so we well, you could just pretend that yes. you have some nanometer cones on, on so the table. So actually, here. you know, kind of about this scale, um, we build, we call them thruster chips, and it's just a convenient form factor, and it's a square centimeter. And on each square centimeter today, we have about five hundred of the actual physical. We call them emitters, those physical cones, um, and we're working on increasing that by a factor of four in the coming months. In, in size or in the in density? In number, in the density, the number of emitters within there, the same square centimeter chip. So that thing, because I think I've seen pictures of you with like a tiny thing in your yeah. hand, that must be the thing. Yeah. Okay, so, so that's that. an engine. Um, so that is kind of the ionization chamber and thrust producing part of it. What's not shown you know, in that picture, um, is the propellant tank. So we can keep supplying more and more of the liquid to those um, emission sites. And then we also provide a power electronic system that talks to the spacecraft and turns our device on and off. So that's the colloid engine. Yes. That's the core of the colloid engine. Um, it's the way I've been talking about it. It's um, more of ion electrospray colloid um tends to mean like liquid droplets coming off of the jet. But if you make smaller and smaller cones, you get pure ions. So we're kind of like a subset of colloid, yes. What uh, aspects of this? You said that it's been full of mystery from the physics perspective. What aspects of this are understood and what are still full of mystery? Yeah, recently um, we've been understanding the kind of instabilities and, and stable regimes of, um, you know, how much liquid do you supply and, and what field do you apply and um, why is it flickering on and off or why does it have these weird behaviors? So that's in the past just couple of years, that's um, become much more understood. Um, I think the two areas that come to mind as far as um, not as well understood are um, the boundary between, you know, you have, um, we, we actually use kind of big molecular ions. And if you're looking at the molecular scale, you have, you know, some ions that you've extracted and they're in this electric field. One ion, you know, it's a big molecule. It's getting energy from the electric field. And some of that energy is going into the bonds and making it vibrate and doing weird things to it. Sometimes it breaks them apart. And then zooming out to the whole beam, the beam has some behaviors as this beam of ions. And there's a big gap between what are those, what, how do you connect those? Um, and how do we understand that better so that we can understand the beam performance of, of the engine? Is that a theory question or is that an engineering question? Theory, definitely. We're, Axion is a, a startup and we're more in the business of building and testing and observing um, and characterizing. Um, and we're not really diving much into the, that theory right now. 